Last time we learned about the origins of the locomotive superiority hypothesis, which says that dinosaurs were superior to Pseudosuchians and other animals of the Triassic in the way they moved, and this is ultimately what led to their success over these groups. As with virtually all hypotheses in science, the idea has some opposition, and this disagreement is what we're going to look at today in this video. In 1983, Benton rejected more competitive models such as the locomotive superiority hypothesis and instead proposed a hypothesis of opportunistic replacement to explain the rise of dinosaurs. In other words, dinosaurs may have just been fortunate holders of a winning evolutionary lottery ticket. He focused on patterns of relative abundance and diversity of species throughout the Triassic and determined, based on what he saw, that it was more likely the Pseudosuchians and Synapsids were just unlucky in extinction events. The Triassic was an environmentally turbulent time, and this led to a number of important changes of plant groups. As the plant life changed, so did the animals, and what had been ideal ecosystems for reptiles such as rhynchosaurs and mammal-related synapses such as the beaked and tusked dicynodonts could no longer support them. Thus, more opportunistic dinosaurs could move in and replace those reptiles and synapsids. In terms of what happened with the Pseudosuchians, their numbers also dwindled in the late Triassic, and Benton again saw that the Triassic-Jurassic extinction was catastrophic for the group, with all but the crocodilomorphs becoming extinct. Due to the demise of most Pseudosuchians, the dinosaurs were able to diversify throughout the late Triassic, and then explosively diversify in the Jurassic, thanks to the space left by those Pseudosuchians that didn't make it. By looking at various faunas spanning the length of the Triassic from a number of locations around the world, Benton was able to study how global form and composition changed over time. Repeatedly, as other groups declined, dinosaurs moved in to fill the ecological space they left behind. Rather than competition or dinosaurs being superior to the other fauna, it was environmental factors that led to their ultimate success. Benton's paper was broad in its investigation and looked at all large vertebrates in each ecosystem, which led to comparison being more focused on archosaurs versus non-archosaurs rather than dinosaurs versus pseudosuchians. Benton's has perhaps been the prevailing view for some time now, and more recent work only seems to strengthen his hypothesis. To better understand the ecological relationships between dinosaurs and pseudosuchians, we need to look at some of these later studies. In 2008, Brissate and colleagues published on a similar theme, focusing instead on the differences between pseudosuchians and Ornithodira, the group that includes dinosaurs, pterosaurs and their ancestors. Again, the results of this study show that the Pseudosuchians died out by chance, save the line leading to the crocodiles, of course, despite being more morphologically diverse in the Triassic. Morphology here just refers to the shape of something, so the Pseudosuchia at this time exhibited a wide variety of body plans, whereas today, crocodilians show very low morphological diversity, which we also call disparity. They're all a pretty similar shape. Brissate's study argued that dinosaurs, rather than being in direct competition with the archosaurs they lived with for 30 million years, diversified together alongside them, although it wasn't until after the Triassic that dinosaurs reached similar levels of disparity as that seen in Triassic Pseudosuchians. Another paper that followed this vein was published by Bernardi and colleagues in 2018. This study focused on evidence from footprints in a more localised setting to show that the timing of the first major radiation of dinosaurs coincided with the environmental upheaval of the Carnian Pluvial Episode, or CPE. The CPE is recognised as being a period of two million years in the late Triassic when the climate dramatically shifted from arid, as it was throughout most of the Triassic, to extremely humid and back to arid again. This study used precise dating techniques to date a rock sequence in the Southern Alps and studied the archosaur footprints found throughout. There were no dinosaur footprints present before the CPE, but plenty of Pseudosuchian tracks, and after the CPE, dinosaur tracks were abundant and the number of Pseudosuchian tracks was greatly reduced. This rapid faunal turnover helps provide more evidence that the gradual faunal replacement of Pseudosuchians was greatly accelerated by the environmental changes of the late Triassic. Bernardi's study suggests that the CPE was the beginning of the end for many Pseudosuchian lineages. Altogether, this idea of opportunistic replacement sounds very convincing. However, these studies have only taken into account measures of abundance, diversity and disparity in relation to gross morphology. There's still a lot more to consider, especially in regards to actually looking at and comparing how these animals were moving, or looking at physiological mechanisms. Next time we will look at some recent work that may lead us to reconsider whether the locomotive superiority hypothesis can really be entirely discounted just yet. 
We hope you will join us, and if you want any more information about the locomotive superiority hypothesis or the Dawn Dinos project, then please visit our website, which will be linked below. We would also like to thank the European Research Council for funding this project.